hello, and welcome once again to another episode of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly Beatles podcast in which we talk all about the Beatles, their beginnings, their entire history, all their recordings, group solo years, and what's going on today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing, which has now been on the air for over 40 years. I also co-host another uh, bi-weekly talk show podcast on the Beatles on the solo years called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I also have my own uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with nothing but interviews and conversations about the Beatles. And I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts on this show. First of all, a man who has been a part of New York Radio for a good 40 years on WFUV, New York's WFUV. And he's just one of the best DJs we've had in New York. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. Don't okay. be Oh, thank you. Darren. That's very nice. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Hello, Dittman. everyone. Yep. Hey there. I'll pay you later, Ken. <laughs> okay. Also, we have with us Alan Kozin. You know Alan for his many years working in the classical department at the New York Times. Also a writer for many decades for Beatle Fan Magazine. And he's also authored a couple of Beatle books, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. Currently, uh, he's been working on a series of books on Paul McCartney's solo career, The McCartney Legacy. Volume one comes out now in December, mm -hmm. <laughs> which we'll talk about briefly. Alan, welcome. Hey, Ken. Hey, Darren. Hello, everyone. We've got a lot to cover here on the show this time. Um, our topic, our main topic for the show is one that I kind of came up with and I didn't realize how difficult a task it was going to be. Um, certainly, as you all know, um, the Beatle compilations 1962 to 1966 and 1967 to 1970 were highly successful and sold millions of copies, was on the charts consistently for so many years. And um, they were great compilations that represented that time period. And so I thought to myself, what if we went further? What if we went into the solo years? And actually the solo recordings, you could say the first ones would be in 1968 with uh, certainly one of Alan's favorite albums, Two Virgins or uh, Wonderwall Music from George Harrison. Um, and I thought we could go from 1968, if you care to go into any of those albums, and go as far as say 1975 and put together a compilation that would be two CDs, um, even though going back to when 62 to 66 and 67 to 70 came out, that was 1973 and there, there was no such thing as CDs back then. But if it came out today and you had a double CD, what would you put on it? Also at the same time thinking that there would be uh, an album configuration of this, most likely the same number of songs would be on four albums. So each of us have compiled a list of what we would put on our own compilation, whether you want to call it 1968 to 1975, 1969 to 1975, however you want it to be, this would be the next compilation. So we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. And also Darren, was witness to three, not just one, but three Ringo Starr and his all-star band concerts. I went to one of them. Uh, this was at the Beacon Theater in New York City. We're gonna talk about that. And I'll talk briefly about seeing Paul McCartney at the first of his two Fenway Park shows in Boston, okay? All that is coming your way here. Uh, but first we have quite a bit of Beatle news to get to, starting with, the news that June 25th, which is a Saturday, is the 13th anniversary of Global Beatles Day. Starting in 2009, it notes the anniversary of the Beatles' historic worldwide broadcast performance of their song, All You Need Is Love. And given the state of the world right now, the founder of Global Beatles Day, Faith Cohen, 
is suggesting honoring the contributions of the Beatles by playing their music exclusively on that day, along with sharing historic and personal photos to uh, the band's worldwide community. She is also suggesting to send the link for the performance of All You Need Is Love to 10 people in your life that really matter. This could be to family, friends, co-workers, or elected officials. It could be kings, queens, princes, presidents, ambassadors, military leaders, law enforcement organizations, and DJs. I put the DJs part in. Oh. We want them. <laughs> I got excited there for a minute. She says we want them to send links to 10 people or organizations that matter in running our world and keeping it going. Then we want them to ask those 10 entities to send it to 10 more and ask them to do the same on and on from the United States, Europe, Russia, China, and even North Korea. Send the link to those in power from the local to global level who keep the world running. End of quote. This sounds like that old shampoo commercial. You tell and two friends and they'll tell two friends, two friends and, so on, and, and so, so on and so on <laughs> and so on. And also, you know, Ringo, as you know, on his birthday, July 7th every year, says to think or say peace and love at the same time around the world. So they're all doing their part. And uh, this is a great idea. One major release coming out this month, we're reminding you, is Olivia Harrison's new book of 20 poems, one for each year since George's passing, called Came the Lightning. 20 poems for George. It's 104 pages with 33 illustrations. A brief description here from Olivia. She says, here on the shore, 20 years later, my message in a bottle has reached dry land. Words about our life, his death, but mostly love and our journey to the end. End of quote. Olivia's book is uh, to be released by Genesis Publications, and that's on June 21st. Then there's news about another book coming from George's first wife. According to the Beatles in Print Together and Solo Facebook page, Patty Boyd is back in the news. On her own Facebook page, she announced that she will have a new book coming out in October called Patty Boyd, My Life in Pictures. The publisher, Real Art Press, said in their press release, My Life in Pictures is a deluxe visual treasure trove featuring over 300 photographs and artworks with Patty sharing full and intimate access to her personal archive for the first time. Patty's archive also includes letters, postcards from friends, diary entries, artifacts and artworks. Uh, most famously, the original Layla album cover painting by Emile Francen. Um, it features extensive photographs from her early modeling career, including Vogue and Vanity Fair, giving a fascinating snapshot into the sea change that occurred in the modeling industry from the post-war demure black and white approach to the psychedelic short skirt swinging 60s. Um, this is uh, described as pictorial feast of imagery in My Life in Pictures is further brought alive by Patty's accompanying stories and recollections. And all pre-orders at um, Real Art Press will be signed by Patty Boyd. Yes. Okay. Paul McCartney posted a message on social media on June the 2nd for Queen Elizabeth II in honor of her platinum jubilee, marking her 70th year on the throne. Paul wrote 70 beautiful years of Queen Elizabeth II. Congrats, ma'am, and thanks. Along with that quote from Paul was a photo of Paul with the Queen when she attended the opening for the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts in 1996, which Paul co-founded. On the subject of Queen Elizabeth, there is a documentary running on Showtime about her. And early on in the first episode, there's a short segment about the Beatles receiving their MBEs and they show the envelope holding John's returned MBE and they talk about it. Thanks to one of our listeners, Bruce Muni, for that information. According to The Independents, Paul McCartney tops the list from the Sunday Times of the richest musicians from the UK and Ireland, saying he has 865 million pounds ahead of the number two artists for which they list the band U2, having 800, oh, I'm sorry, 625 million pounds. 
followed by, I'm sorry to tell you this, Alan, Andrew Lloyd Webber with 495 million pounds. <clears throat> Webber's wealth actually went down because of the pandemic's effect on the theater industry. Sorry, he's dropped to number three, Alan. The Sunday Times gave us a top 20 list and also included at number eight are Olivia and Danny Harrison at 295 million pounds. And at number nine, Sir Ringo Starr at 285 million pounds. It is interesting that John Lennon or Yoko and Sean are not listed at all. Isn't it and just British? That's what I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah, since they moved to the US. Ringo Starr did indeed receive an honorary doctorate of music at Berkeley College and was able to be in Boston last Thursday, where the school held a celebration for him to honor his lifelong contributions to the music scene. And students there performed and arranged Ringo's hits. Greg Bissonette, Ringo's other drummer in his all-star band, and Berkeley president Erica Mule provided the opening remarks. Ringo's artwork is now on display through June the 12th at the C. Parker Gallery in Greenwich, Connecticut. It's called Painting is My Madness 2, T-O-O, and it's described as a unique retrospective of Ringo's artwork from 2005, including two never released limited edition prints exclusive to the C. Parker Gallery. We're very happy for the multi-talented producer, songwriter, and musician, Alan Parsons, who just received an OBE. That's the Order of the British Empire from Queen Elizabeth via Prince William. An OBE is one step below a CBE. And in case you're curious, because you might've heard about this a few years ago, Peter Asher received a CBE, Commander of the Order of the British Empire, in 2015. So Paul and Ringo have been knighted, as has George Martin. It's nice to see other producers being honored here as well. Uh, Julian Lennon performed this past Saturday for the Everland Concert for Climate and did a song called Change. This is during UNEP, that is United Nations Environment Program, their World Environmental Day celebrations. Julian was commissioned by Everland to create the theme track for a sequence of quick documentary movies about forest conservation initiatives that he represents. He not only performed this new song called Change, but also his chestnut song, Saltwater, environmentally conscious song right there, and the song Someday. Time Magazine has a brand new collector's issue which is out to celebrate Paul's 80th birthday. It's written by Glenn Greenberg, covering his entire life and career from the Beatles to today. You can order the issue now on Amazon and it can be found in select supermarkets, bookstores and drugstores, okay? And also the magazine Classic Pop Presents has a new issue also devoted to Paul McCartney for his 80th birthday. The front page reads the life and times of a pop genius. Then it says beyond the Beatles, hits, Harmony and Heartbreak. This is a 132 page collector's issue. Some special events coming up here to report. You recall that last year we had a tribute album to Paul and Linda McCartney's album Ram called Ram On, which featured the drummer on the album and first drummer in Wings, Denny Sywell, along with musician Fernando Perdomo. Well, springing off of that, there will be a concert that is a tribute to the album Ram On, the Ram album, with many of the artists that played on the tribute. It'll be held on July 16th at the Troubadour. And to purchase tickets, you can go to troubadour.com. Okay, that'll be nice to see. There'll be a Beatle Festival in Charlotte, North Carolina on Ju uh, July 22nd and 23rd. Among the guests there will be The Circle, Mickey Dolans, and the tribute bands The Fab Four and the Tosco Music Beatles Tribute. For more information on that, you can go to their website, fabfestcharlotte.org. The Fab Four Music Festival, hosted by Charles Rosenay, is a one-day all Beatles and solo Solo Beatles Music Festival, has 10 bands from the tri-state area playing. This year it'll be held on August 6th at the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center in Simsbury, Connecticut. 
Details are now coming out regarding the upcoming Fest for Beatle fans in Chicago. That's at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare from August 12th to the 14th. It'll feature some of the same guests as the one in, uh, in April in New Jersey. Those include drummer extraordinaire and member of Ringo's All-Stars, Greg Bissonette, Billy J. Kramer, uh, Peter Asher will be at that one. Chris O'Dell, Lawrence Juber, Mark Lewison, the band Liverpool, of course, the Weaklings, Gary Astridge, that's Ringo's drum curator, and Simon Weitzman who was a guest here on our show, bringing you the world premiere of the new documentary film Here, There, and Everywhere, a love letter to the Beatles from the fans, and also Ken Womack, who will have a sneak preview of his forthcoming biography book on Mal Evans. All that at the Fest for Beatles fans. You need more info? Just go to thefest.com. We're almost done. And Pete Best will be making a rare appearance in the U.S. He'll be appearing at the Super Mega Fest at the Westford Regency Inn in Westford, Massachusetts. That's the weekend of September 30th through October the 2nd. For more information, go to the website, Super Mega Fest. Dot com. And as we mentioned earlier, the new book from Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair and Adrian Sinclair, McCartney <laughs> Legacy, Volume One, is now being delayed until December the 13th. The reasons being what they're telling us is the length and complexity of the book. The thing is, it's, you know, how complex is a book? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I think. Um, the manuscript was like 325,000 words, um, which is roughly 100,000 more than theoretically it was supposed to be if you take things like contracts seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And they didn't ever say anything about cutting it. And in fact, we just went through the whole thing again to do an edit and added another 10,000 words and told them we were gonna add another 10,000 words and they didn't complain. Um, and plus, you know, we've been talking to them about how we want the photos treated. And we thought it would make sense to have the photos right in the text um, mm -hmm. rather than in a central photo section so that instead of having to have a caption, you know, we'll, we'll have captions anyway, but um, the photo will be right where the thing that's being spoken of is. So it will sort of, you know, make a certain amount of sense, but I guess that makes it more complicated too. So, um, and uh, also our agent has said that in the last three months, there's been a lot of delays in the publishing industry. And so we're just sort of catching that too. So December 13th cuts it really close to Christmas, but um, you know, hope everyone gets one for everyone they know. <laughs> as long as it comes out before the end of the year and you can pre-order it. Yeah. But just, just to clear things up, the photos are all kept together now or are they kept with the text? No, they're going to be in the text. Okay. So, for instance, we have some pictures of um, they, they went to Spain uh, in 73 and uh, uh, around the time of uh, Paul's 30th birthday um, or 72, 72. Um, and uh, we got some pictures from there that have never been published with you know all of wings plus this bunch of kids that they did a little concert for hmm. um the kids had had come down to the hotel where they were staying to use the the the, the pool or the beach you know some facilities and they were being thrown out and paul and denny came down and then the rest um with acoustic guitars and and just sort of you know played some songs for them we got pictures of that and you know they've never been seen before so you know when it gets to that part of the story the pictures will be right there like that mm, i can't yeah. wait i mean it's gonna be yeah. as narrow as could be and as you said this will cover through the end of 73 right mm -hmm. on the run time. yep okay and there's one little piece of news also about our colleague here and we do know that you, you certainly made it when your name is the answer <laughs> in the New York Times crossword puzzle. That was a Boston Globe. <laughs> oh, Boston Globe, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. It just said what, New York Times critic? And then- No, it, it said um, music critic Cozen was the clue and five letters, so. Okay. Uh, so Ringo obviously was the, <laughs> the answer. 
Well, congratulations. Thank you. I, I, I thought the clue should have been, you know, main detractor of the Boston Red Sox on the New York Times music staff, but, you know. Uh, how did you, did you, were you doing the puzzle and you discovered it or did someone call? Actually, call? actually yeah. someone I knew from, you know, grade school sent me a Facebook message saying you're in the Boston Globe crossword puzzle. Um, so I said, oh, really? You know, and, and <laughs> went down and, and picked one up and I was 65 across. <laughs> that should be a collector's item. At some point, I think it should be. <laughs> of course, it should have said things. Co host of things we said today. <laughs> anyway, so congratulations, Alan. Thanks. And um, before we get to our main topic, we're going to talk a little bit about seeing Ringo Starr and his all star band at the Beacon Theater in New York City. As I said before, Darren got to go to all three shows. I was at the first one. So let me ask you, first of all, Darren, I mean, you've seen. You've been to all the tours, haven't you? It, it, there may be a couple that didn't come through the New York tri-state area. That's possible where there might have been an adjustment to the lineup once or twice through the years. But as far as I know, is if, if, if the tour came through the New York area, I've seen them all. Yeah. You know, I have vague memories of being at the Jones Beach Theater for the very first one. I was there. In 1989. I get them for some reason, 1989 and 90 mixed up, but yeah, I was, I was at all of them. And what, what, what was a little weird with this one, of course, was the pandemic uh, postponed the tour twice. Mm -hmm. So in uh, one of the nights um, trying to figure out with a, a couple of friends of mine, if they paid for their tickets or not, we couldn't remember. And I just went digging around and noticed that the tickets had been purchased November um, 2019, November 2019. And the pandemic started that March. The shows were going to be in June 2020. So that was like, that's very, very weird uh, that I'm finally using these tickets that have been sitting around since the end of 2019. Uh, and the dates, all the rescheduling was done in a similar part time. You know, I guess the tour, they were able to keep it in the similar time frame, all of the shows were scheduled for June and then were postponed to June in 2021. And for the reschedule this year, they ended up being three consecutive nights, which is not what they were originally. There was going to be some spaces between uh, dates. So uh, it just turned out that with all the rescheduling, the Beacon Theater shows were Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, back to back to back. And you were there for the first one, the first show. Right. And, and I was there for all three. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, time hasn't changed. <laughs> it's it's just like the last tour for the most part. And we do know that there were changes made with the lineup with Hamish Stewart being added as well as Colin Hay. I mean, they were there in the last band, but there was that adjustment that was made um, when Greg Raleigh had to leave. And um, the Mr. Mr. Guy, <laughs> whose name Richard I, Page. Richard Page, yes. Okay, so yeah, uh, what was your overall impression? Uh, I thought the, I thought, and I, I, you know, I wish that I could kind of go back and um, tap into my head and get my opinions about past shows because it always seems like, oh, this was the best one yet. Oh, mm -hmm. this was the best. Um, so I won't say this was the best one because uh, I don't know. But I could tell you this much, the band was tight as hell. They were really good. Uh, and um, I mean, I re vaguely remember when Colin Hay was in the band and maybe it was the first time he was in the all-star band. And, and he had to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it came to lead guitar. Hmm. I do not recall the year or the rest of the lineup, but I just seem to remember he did admirably well, but the show lacked that punch of having a um, virtuoso on, uh, as a lead guitarist. It seemed to me that Colin really was playing much better than I remember. And there were a couple of leads that he took, 
um, Hamish Stewart, who I don't think was the bass player in the average white band. Um, we'd have to look that up now. Again, maybe he was. McCartney, he tended to be rhythm guitar and switch to bass when Paul would go to the keyboards. Right. So, but I mean, Hamish was really, was really uh, killing it on bass. I mean, the band was outstanding. Now, the interesting thing was, and maybe I'm kind of like reading too much or in case yet, yeah, you know, the folks watching now didn't know, Edgar Winter came down with COVID. Mm -hmm. And Edgar Winter is at least temporarily out of the tour now. He was not at the Beacon for the second and third shows. We saw him on Monday. It did seem to me that he didn't have a lot of energy on stage. And I wonder if he just was not starting not to feel well that Monday night at the Beacon Theater night one. Um, it was very strange when the second show started. I didn't even notice till three songs in that Edgar wasn't on stage. Um, and I was, um, you know, wondering if I perhaps he stepped off for a couple of seconds. Maybe he maybe last night he wasn't here for what goes on. Maybe he left. It was very strange to suddenly realize, wait a minute, where's Edgar Winter? And as the show progressed, it became clear there's an issue here. Uh, Steve Lukather, uh, I have the set list. Steve Lukather's first song was, um, was it Rosanna first or Africa? Rosanna. Uh, he made it a point to say, we're going to have to do this without keyboards. Um, which I thought, ooh, that's strange. I hope Edgar, I hope Edgar's okay. And the show was proceeding exactly the same as Monday did. All they did was drop Edgar Winter songs. They didn't replace them with anything. They didn't substitute anything. They just did the Monday night. If you saw the Monday night show with the Beacon or if you saw the uh, tour before it arrived in New York, they did the set list. They just skipped over Edgar Winter's three songs, Free Ride, Frankenstein, and Johnny B. Good. Um, and I didn't really miss the presence of the lack of a keyboard. They just proceeded with one sax player, Warren Ham, mm -hmm. because a lot of times Warren and Edgar Winter were playing together sax and keyboards, no keyboard, no keyboards, but they did have his equipment out. Uh, and on Tuesday night, that's what made me think perhaps he's not well, but they expect him um to to join the show in progress perhaps he couldn't find a parking spot uh uh because on night two his keyboards were out set up ready for him but it was dark last night for the third show they were still set up and i thought could it be that they've actually rang up and got greg raleigh to come back temporarily uh because there were some posters around the beacon uh, some of the signage was using uh, the photographs of the band members, including Greg Raleigh in there, not Edgar Winter. Oh. And now I cannot remember if Monday night, the first show, if Edgar Winter's photo was amongst the other members of the band without Greg Raleigh. I made it a point uh, on the third and final night, which was last night, we're taping this on a Thursday, to look and I saw Greg Raleigh's face uh, in place of Edgar Winter and thought, could it be that they were able to fly him to New York? He pretty much would know all the material. Um, it would be an easy way to kind of get the show back to the full length and to plug in those three spaces uh, with, with Santana or Journey songs. Um, but no, there was no Greg Raleigh. It was just a dark keyboard that went untouched for two straight nights. And uh, they just skipped over Edgar Winter songs, Ringo did mention on the second show, the Tuesday night, about midway through the show, he mentioned that Edgar Winter tested positive for COVID, and that was it. There was no mention of Edgar Winter whatsoever on the third night, like he was not even part of the tour. Um, they just, just proceeded without any mention of him or anything, and no get well soons, 
nothing like that. I almost got the impression, and please don't hold me to this, is just, you know, the thought I had that him testing positive may have kind of angered possibly some of those behind the scenes because it just seemed like they were proceeding without acknowledging that Edgar was even on the tour. I could be completely off base uh, uh, saying that the fact that Ringo didn't even mention Edgar on the second, the third of the Beacon shows, I thought was odd. And, and, and uh, the second show, again, I read into expression. Once I realized Edgar Winter's not here, there's a problem. It seemed like everybody was business as usual. There wasn't a lot of smiles and perhaps they had to focus in and because things, subtle changes without the keyboard player being there or they were totally thrown off yeah. by uh, his absence. But uh, that was the only, the only unusual thing, like you said, Ken, a Ringo tour with the all-star band if you've seen a bunch of them, the formula is exactly the same. And if you enjoy them, you're going to enjoy them. You're not going to be disappointed. Um, so it was a big thumbs up and it would be great to have. A, I wish he would still put out at least Blu-rays and DVDs of his tours mm -hmm. as souvenirs, as documents of them. He'd stopped with the live albums, it seems, a while back now. But... Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that about Edgar Winter because, and I was talking to my wife, Joanne, who was with me, she was saying that Edgar doesn't seem the same on stage. And he was walking he, slow. What's that? He was walking slowly, but that could be age. Yeah. You know, and I also, I almost detected also a very, very slight hunch, but he's older from the last time I saw him with the, with the all-star band, but perhaps he was starting, you know, even if he was fully vaccinated, which I assume he would be because he's on tour with everyone else, you know, you get COVID. I know a few people that actually got hit just as hard post vaccinations as, you know, before. So maybe he was not feeling well. You wouldn't have known it from his performance. He was, you know, dead on. His performance was fantastic no yeah. matter what, but I just kind of felt like the energy level wasn't as much as it usually is and most noticeably you know when, when you're used to seeing the keyboard player like Greg Raleigh in the band his keyboards are facing the band Edgar was facing the wall <laughs> yeah, his back was to towards the band you know oh. so it wasn't as much I didn't feel as much togetherness he didn't spend as much time walking around hanging around with the other musicians like everybody does you know and it could just be that he wasn't feeling well because of... Maybe they... Uh, maybe, mm, very interesting. Maybe he was not well on the first show. Mm. And they tried to see if they could, you know, because if, you know, you hear about who's asymptomatic, they're fully vaccinated, I have COVID, I'm asymptomatic. Mm. Uh, maybe he was started out <laughs> asymptomatic. I have no idea. This is all complete... Um, Help me here. I'm drawing a blank on the word I'm looking for. Conject, um, Conjecture? Thank you. <laughs> I need a nap. I didn't nap before we did this. Uh, it's all assuming and then it's reading in to, to you know, what came after. Um, but uh, that aside, and I really, I, I really respected Edgar Winter for many years um, and have been a fan for many years. I missed him being there. And Frankenstein's always uh, a lot of fun to watch let alone listen to. So, but the others, the rest of the band, the other shows, man, they were dead on. Colin Hay is singing like he's a young man. Uh, I would dare I say, I think he sounded better as he's gotten older. Hmm. Hamish Stewart was totally into the whole thing. Right. Um, you know, and uh, if you're going to see the tour yet if you're going to catch maybe one of the shows coming up or a little later on in the year as a second leg um you you will you will enjoy it's uh, a good one <laughs> well i would just add to that that when they did frankenstein and that's one of the songs where ringo leaves the stage and takes a break but uh, it was beyond fantastic yeah. and um greg bissonette i gotta tell you he is a monster Mm -hmm. we're mentioning frankenstein but he is a monster behind the drum set 
Yeah. And he's just so fantastic the way he compliments Ringo. But there's a moment there towards the end of Frankenstein where you know that he and Edgar trade drum solos together. Right. And um, Greg does some very clever things that I hadn't heard him do before. I don't know if I should have a spoiler here, a spoiler alert. Well, uh, he didn't do what once two things that happened with Edgar Winter out of the picture. Yeah. Second and third shows, Greg Bissonnette lost his uh, his 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 solo right. in the spotlight in Frankenstein because there was no Frankenstein. And Ringo only got a one song break, not a two song break, because he also sat sits out a second song. Um. I should have opened my notes up beforehand. Uh, before Frankenstein is um, trying to remember. Was it cut the? I think cut the cake. Yeah, cut the cake. The average white band song. Yeah. Ringo sits it out and sits out Frankenstein. Once Edgar Winter was was missing, they didn't do Frankenstein, and Ringo only got one song off. So he had to come back out, and uh, you know what's not getting mentioned? He did Octopus's Garden. Yes. Which is a big surprise. Uh, which was fun, and it was so it fit in so seamlessly that um, if, if the friend of mine who I was with on Monday night hadn't told me, I never realized he never performed Octopus's Garden. He brought "I'm the Greatest" back, mm -hmm. which was great. Uh, no knock on the song, but I always thought it was one of the weaker current or recent songs. He removed "Anthem" from the set list. Um, no, the, it, the newest song he did was from 1973. Mm -hmm. He did Photograph, he did On the Greatest. Right. Like, yeah. I thought maybe he would do the title track to What's, What's My Name, because Colin Hay wrote it. No. Nothing from either EP. No. <laughs> um, even Steve Lukather made a joke about, before he, did, uh, before he went into Africa, said, I'm going to do a new song for you now. No, 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 I won't do that to you. <laughs> you know, like it was torturous. Yeah. Uh, if he did have a new song to perform. But um, no complaints. Great show. A lot of fun. Um, the only criticism that I could make of the show, and this is from where I was sitting, and I've heard other people say it, I thought the mix was really bad <laughs> at the Beacon Theater. It was very <laughs> echoey. Whenever any of the performers got to talk, I couldn't really hear them that well. That uh, is, I don't think that was Ringo. I many, 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 many times have gone to the Beacon Theater and have been very unhappy with the sound. I'm one of the only people that feel this way. I'm not a big fan of shows at the Beacon Theater uh, because if you're not sitting on the floor or if you're not centered, for some reason, sound gets lost in that place. There have been many shows I've seen up in the loge and in the balcony Robert Plant, I walked out on after two or three songs because it was just a, a muddy mess. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Uh, went to see Rufus Wainwright there and slept through the show because I couldn't make out what was going on because mm -hmm. I was up in the balcony. And if I can't get floor seats and if they can't be near or in the center, I pass. Even, no, if it was Ringo, I wouldn't pass, but... Uh, the Beacon, I think, has a tendency of having problems with sound. Mm. It certainly did from where I was sitting. Because it sounded great Monday night where I was. Oh, okay. And it is kind of shocking in a way that he did Octopus's Garden because for years he would say, I'm not going to do two underwater songs in the same show. He's not going to do that and Yellow Submarine. So, um yeah, but that was a nice surprise. Definitely. Yeah. He's only really done it with the Roundheads. You know? Okay. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. And um, I'll just say a few things about the McCartney show at Fenway. It was uh, a really enjoyable show. I think um, kind of what I've been saying and, and, and my colleagues on my podcast have been saying part of the joy in going to see Paul McCartney is to watch the people around you. You see a very family atmosphere with parents bringing their kids. And it's so much fun to see the reaction of the younger generation watching Paul McCartney in most cases for the first time. And what a joy it is that he's still doing this at his age. I could say the same thing about Ringo because let's face it, this is gonna be a great memory for these 
younger people, they're going to tell their kids sometime in the future, you know, I got to see Paul McCartney win, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, you know, I, I've complained a lot about the set list and that's only because I think he's got the most amazing catalog, Beatles and Solo, and I wish he would shake it up. But I was kind of impressed with his voice. I mean, I'm not going to say it was great, but it was better than the last time that I heard it. And what I noticed about him most of all was that he wasn't really trying to push his voice that much. He wasn't trying to project it a lot. And he just wanted to be able to handle the songs and perform them well enough to keep going. I, I don't think that, um, you know, if you listen to his voice during these shows, you'll probably say he did everything well. I don't know if you'd go to this concert saying his voice was great. You know, that's also because we've been spoiled <laughs> from so many other tours in the past when he had one of the greatest voices ever. It still is very good for someone who does a near three hour show, almost 80 years old. It's something to be admired for that he can pull this off and to play all the different musical instruments that he does and to see people around you in in wonderment of this man who does all this stuff to move around from bass to electric guitar to a ukulele to mandolin to piano and back and forth playing lead guitar here acoustic guitar there and um it's still a great show and you know it was really strange i never thought i'd be saying this because i look at the playlist and I, as you know, want more solo material. But when I'm listening through this entire show, I didn't feel like it was so completely Beatle heavy. You know, there were, in the very beginning of the show, he went from Junior's Farm to Letting Go, back to back, two great wing songs like that. And to still show respect for the album new and to play the title track, and to play the two songs of Egypt Station, Come On To Me and For You, um, and the classics in there like Bad On The Run and Live and That Die, it still felt you know, a bit more balanced than I thought it would be. So, but it was, um, it, it was very interesting for me to observe how Paul tries to get through uh, a near three hour concert like this vocally. And he knows what he's capable of doing. He knows his limitations. The problem that I had, again, I didn't like the mix from where I was sitting. I was all the way back in the grandstand at uh, Fenway. I was just happy to be there. Tickets are really expensive these days and I wasn't about to spend more than I already had. And um, again, it, it was very echoey. In most cases, McCartney through the, from the 2000s on, um, I think his concerts have been way too loud. I didn't think it was loud this time, but I did feel like there were times when his vocals were buried from the rest of the band. And that bothered me a lot. When I could hear him, he sounded fine. And as you, I'm sure probably know, McCartney concerts are so much of a religious experience at this point that all these people who are there, especially the, the newbies that have never seen him live, and here he is singing, hey Jude, they're all singing with him all the words <laughs> and oh blah dee oh blah da they're all singing it that's such a crowd pleaser but i'm not hearing paul sing it you know i'm seeing him on the screen he's mouthing the words it's great yeah. but i want to hear paul <laughs> so um yeah it's part of the fun of going to the show knowing that this is an icon how many of them do we have left who are of this caliber and um just the fact that he can pull this off is still so extraordinary, even though I'm sure he's going to be doing less and less of them. And it's very smart that he's spacing them apart, even though he did two shows in a row at Fenway, two days in a row. But um, I was pleased. I'm always glad to go. I'm always interested to know what his playlist will be, if he'll change it in any way. I liked, um, you know, bringing back certain songs like getting better. It was very strange what he did with um, You Never Give Me Your Money because oh, he yeah. goes right into yeah, yeah. out of college money spent in the song. And then he goes into She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. It's very jarring to start yeah, the yeah. song that way. I don't know why he chose that. It was very odd. Um, I'm still glad that he did it because at least it was something different. 
even though he's done, you never give me your money. But he did that alone on the piano. Uh -huh. I don't know. Did he do um, Women and Wives? Is that the song from McCartney 3 that he Absolutely. had been doing? That's the only song from McCartney 3 that he has done. But when I saw him, he, he did Let Him In. And I looked at the playlist um, for last night's show, the second show at Fenway, and he did Let Him In again. So I don't know if he's completely dropped Women and Wives. I don't know for sure. But I also noticed that he added Jet to the set list last night. And when he added it, he didn't take anything out. So people who went to the second Fenway show got one extra song. I don't know if he's going to keep doing Jet, but, uh, you know, he's done Jet on most of his tours. Yeah. But still, it's just interesting. Usually whenever he replaces, he, he either he replaces a song with another, with another song. He doesn't give you an extra song. <laughs> but he did that for the second Fenway show. But... Um, Oh, if it, it's, still, it's a great show. If it was a baseball game you were at, where were your seats in, in, in re regards to the field? Where okay. were you sitting? It would, be, it would be more from home plate as far back as you could go in the grandstand. It was the next to last row. Up, upstairs at the top. And there was an overhang as well. Okay. So, yeah. And the crowd sang happy birthday to him. Kind of funny. They don't sing his birthday song. Yeah. And one thing that I thought was really funny, he said, uh, I understand there's a guy in the crowd that has seen me 123 times and everybody's laughing. And I'm thinking, is Rick Glover there? Yeah. And then the camera is on that person. It wasn't Rick. And um, and then he said, some people are kind of obsessive. <laughs> Everybody laughed. <laughs> so uh and he told some of the same stories. You know, I had one guy sitting behind me who was a little inebriated. You could tell he's never seen McCartney because he's laughing at every story that Paul said, which he's told so many times at all these concerts. You know, the Jimi Hendrix story, <laughs> everything. It's like he's never heard it before. So you got to realize there's still so many people that have never seen McCartney live. And it is a blessing that, that he and Ringo are still doing this. Yeah. I did notice that about the All-Star Band was that they too were, all, all of the members were telling similar story, uh, you're telling the same story before their songs. Um, and I'm thinking, did they tear a page out of the Paul McCartney concert handbook 101? <laughs> you know, Hamish Stewart would tell the same story the three nights that this studio average white band recorded in. I don't know which one it was in Manhattan is now an apartment, was an empty lot, now an apartment building. Right. You know, uh, that bit, little bit, which was pretty funny when Steve Lukather starts playing other Beatles songs on the guitar for the next one, and Ringo would put his hand on the strings and go, no, we're not doing that. Hmm. They did that, you know, so, uh, um, yeah, so similar type deal there, Colin Hay telling... Uh, actually, last night he did crack a joke that he, I don't remember him doing the other two nights about um, um, in the song uh, Overkill, the Men at Work song Overkill. There's the line, ghosts appear and fade away. Right. And he told a story about a guy who would come up to him at a show a long time ago and said, you're going to do that song about the goats that appear? <laughs> so, you know, uh, that got a chuckle. And I don't remember that in the first couple of nights. You know, him talking about goats appearing and fading away. Hmm. But I'll be seeing McCartney one week from tonight. Final show of the, this this leg uh, of the tour, or uh, there's another batch of shows. Has he announced anything coming up? No. no. No, I'm getting mixed up with Ringo's tour. So this is the last one of Got Back next Thursday, the 16th, two days before his 80th birthday at uh, MetLife Stadium. Yeah, we shall see if he adds more dates. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling nothing will be done until after he celebrated his 80th birthday. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, what a week. Now I got another week to go because we're going to MetLife and I'm going to Tanglewood. Back again in Massachusetts. All right. Thank you enough in Massachusetts. I feel I'm going back to Massachusetts. Two BGs. <laughs> All right, so now our main topic, as I mentioned before, we've all compiled a list of songs that we feel would make 
a best of, I guess. We all have our own different intentions with this list because to me, what I envisioned originally was a continuation of the Red and the Blue album, which essentially was a greatest hits package. But when you get to the Blue album, because there were less singles being released by the Beatles, you had to add album tracks, no matter what. And it was a great opportunity in that, that particular compilation because certain albums like Sgt. Pepper or the White Album, when they were released, didn't have any singles at all. How can you avoid those albums anyway? So um, there's a part of me that wants this to be a greatest hits because there are certain singles that I consider to be essential but not everybody may feel the same way as I do. What I really kind of envision this to be more of is the approach that Paul took with his Pure McCartney release from a few years ago, which was if he was going on the road in his car, what songs from him would he like to hear? And he threw in many hits. He threw him a lot, a lot of deep album cuts. So that's the approach that I took each of you may have come up with a completely different approach. So we're gonna find out from the two of you and then I'll read my list. And uh, who shall I start with? How about Alan? Okay. Um, the way I approached it was, um, I'm not a record company and this thing isn't coming out. So I don't have to um, really think that much about the hits. I mean, I. I I'm not saying there shouldn't be hits on it. Um, and there are certain ones that I think are so important. They have to be on. Um, and I included those, but basically um, I just included what I wanted to <laughs> um, from all the albums. Well, I went from 69 to 75. Right. Um, also I, didn't keep strictly to chronology. I, I, it's mainly chronological. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to have like, you know, three songs of John's from Imagine and then three songs of Paul's from uh, Wildlife, or it would have been the opposite way. Um, I, I, I wanted to sort of mix them so that you would go from, you know, John, Paul, George, Ringo. Not every time. It's not always possible to do that. Um, uh, and also there were certain thematic things that uh, I wanted to do. Like, for instance, I mean, when you, I mean, I'll get there eventually, but, you know, too many people is followed by how do you sleep um, is followed by dear friend. Um, so, you know, there, there are little, little pockets within the sequence. Um, so I did it as two CDs two CDs, uh, each CD would be 80 minutes. So that gives you two hours and 40. And my list is two hours and 39 minutes and 50 seconds. It's pretty close. First time I put this together, I thought this was going to be easy. My first sequence of I just threw into a playlist everything that I thought should be in there, you know, hits, album tracks, whatever. And to my amazement, it came out to be four hours. So I realized that, okay, I've, I've, I've got a little bit of work to do here. And, and, you know, every day I would go in and throw a few more out. Um, and then this morning I realized I had miscalculated. I thought I only needed two hours and 20 minutes because math isn't my thing. <laughs> um, then I realized if you have two 80 minute CDs, I can put 20 minutes worth of stuff back. So I did that. Um, so anyway, it's a bit of a... It sounds like you created the time life volume of the best of the be <laughs> solo Beatles. Of the solo it's Beatles, your yeah. Ten volume set now. Up to 1975. I mean, you keep in mind there are so many things that, you know, just were not out by 75. I mean, at one point, even before the four hour version, I thought, you know, it would be really good to include something unreleased from each of them, you know, throughout this but forget it you know we're just dealing with release stuff so this is uh you know i thought of it as the green album um and so it's I. yeah well then okay so it starts with cold turkey um originally started with give peace a chance but that went out in one of the uh purges 
Um, partly because, you know, much as I, I love, like Give Peace a Chance, you know, it's a good song. And, you know, we've heard it a lot. Uh, and in a certain way, it's not a song song. It's more of a protest song for a particular time. And, you know, given an unlimited amount of time it would have been in, but I ended up getting rid of it. And Cold Turkey, I just thought it was also a great way to open an album. You got that little burst of guitar at the beginning. Um, that's one way to do it. So from Cold Turkey to Every Night of Paul, then back to John for Instant Karma, then back to Paul for Maybe I'm Amazed. I mean, if it was going to do Ringo this early, I mean, none of the tracks from Sentimental Journey, much as I like them, kind of felt like they would go in this sequence, you know? I just couldn't find a way to do it. Um, but after Maybe I'm Amazed, uh, Boo Coops of Blues. So Ringo finally makes an appearance at track five. Uh, then George, What Is Life? Um, two Georges in a row, What Is Life in My Sweet Lord? I kind of thought that, you know, for, for George, um, well, for any of them, if it seemed necessary, but for George, it, it certainly does, is um, I should be dealing with what his concerns were at the time. And what is life in My Sweet Lord were definitely, you know, up the top of the list of his concerns. So they're on there from All Things Must Pass. Then um, seeing as we've got George singing My Sweet Lord, it seemed to make sense to me in, you know, my odd way to go to John singing God, <laughs> even though very different approach. <laughs> um, this is what George does believe in, what John doesn't believe in, you know. Um, and then Ringo, It Don't Come Easy, seemed in a way to tie up the whole God or not God or whatever thing is, you know, okay, don't come easy. Um, back to Paul and Linda for another day uh, and backseat to my car and too many people. So we got three Pauls in a row. Um, this was a problem because, you know, Paul has so much more stuff than everybody. Yep. Um, so that had to happen. I, as much as I wanted to keep mixing them, you know, it happened on Beatles albums too. There were songs of two, three Paul vocals in a row and then John. Uh, so why not? So backseat in my car, too many, too many people. How do you sleep from John and dear friend from John, uh, sorry, from Paul, <laughs> about John. Uh, and then John singing, Give Me Some Truth. Um, George, Deep Blue. Wait, time out. I'm yeah. writing this down. Too Many People was followed by How Do You Sleep? Yeah. And then Dear Friend. Deep Truth. And then Deep Blue. No, no. Um, so how do you sleep, dear friend? Give me some truth. Okay. Dear and friend, then deep, and then deep blue. I thought deep blue, deep blue was one of the ones I added back today, uh, just because it was, you know, it's a B side. It's never, no one ever plays it. Um, and it's, I kind of like it, you know, it's, uh, it, I think it's one of these songs he wrote when his uh, mother was dying and, um, um, captures, you know, some of that feeling of it's 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 not really a blues track. It's kind of a blues track. It's 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 George um, like it. And it was sort of a choice between if it was going to go for an obscure blue side, it was going to be either that or Miss Odell uh, really would have wanted to have Miss Odell, too, but ran out of time. Um, so Deep Blue to Paul's Tomorrow. So it goes from Deep Blue to Tomorrow to Imagine. Oh, okay. To Bangladesh, the single of Bangladesh. Um, then Little Lamb Dragonfly. Ooh. Then Mind Games. Um, yeah, you know, I think if you, anyone who's been listening for the last um, however many months worth of shows knows that anything like this that I put together is going to have backseat in my car and Little Lamb Dragonfly. It's just got to happen. Um, so, okay. Little Lamb Dragonfly, then Mind Games, George's Who Can See It from um, Living in the Material World, 
Why did you pick that one? Um, like the tune, um, I, I I just think it's a it's it, it's a beautiful track, and again, it's another one of you know a song about George's concerns, um, and uh, I I don't know I I. I again was going for some obscure stuff that i felt needs to be heard more than it is okay and so and and that's sort of out of nowhere really um amazing song you know, yeah then live and let die couldn't not have live and let die you know i, I just yeah anyway uh live and let die then photograph then hi 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 then you're 16, you see what I'm doing there, I'm just mixing. Um, then Ding Dong, uh, sorry, <laughs> give me love, give me um, peace on earth. Then Band on the Run, six o'clock, yeah. Ringo. Cause it's Ringo really and Paul, Paul is on it and he wrote it. Um, then back to Band on the Run for Picasso's last words because that is such a an odd track you know i mean it has first of all the great backstory of you know dinner with dustin hoffman and dustin hoffman just challenging him to hear write about this you know and he did it and but by the time he recorded it it became a really complex thing with multiple parts and the you know bits of of, of uh you know it's not really from French radio. It's actually from BBC's foreign language service, uh, reading some, some stuff and uh, some French cafe music. And, you know, so Picasso's last words, then Dark Horse, um, you know, back to George, John number nine dream. Um, so we're getting near the end uh, and surprise, surprise, Sweet Bird of Paradox. Um, we're now up, up to Walls and Bridges. Then back to George's Dark Horse for Ding Dong Ding Dong. Over to Paul for Junior's Farm. So we're in 74 now. So uh, Ringo back off Boogaloo. Actually, that's, that's a little out of sequence, but. Um, Paul, Venus and Mars and Rock Show, you know, for his 1975 stuff, you couldn't not have those two, but there were actually other things I wanted to include that I couldn't get in there because, you know, it had to be that from Venus the album and Mars. Versions, hmm? The album versions of yeah. Venus and Mars Rock Show. Yeah, yeah, because the live ones didn't come out during the period that we're covering. No, I'm talking about the single, the edit. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, I could have saved a couple of minutes there and got another song in. <laughs> and it would have been a rare version. Uh, oh, well. But it's horrible. <laughs> I know, uh, it is. Uh, and then uh, George Harrison gets the last two words. Um, first, you. And then this guitar can't keep from crying. And all of that fit? 40 songs, two hours, 39 minutes, and 50 seconds. Wow. Very impressive. I got to ask you a couple things. How come surprise, surprise? Like it. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a record company. So I'm not a record company. I can just do what like I like. <laughs> so you have surprise, surprise in there with Elton John, and you don't have whatever gets you through the night. I got rid of whatever gets you through the night for because you hear it all the time. I, I just, you know, a in a way I, that you hear all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah i mean i guess yeah it was you know, it, whatever gets through the night was in the four hour version <laughs> okay one other thing when you were talking about um my sweet lord and what is life those were songs that addressed george's concerns that's why you you put it in there right so then you could say the same thing about give peace a chance <laughs> oh mean, absolutely um Okay, uh, I, I'm, not sure. I'm not I sure I can understand. Okay, I think of what is life and my sweet Lord as more finished songs 
than give peace a chance. Give peace a chance. They're in a hotel room with a lot of people. They're recording it kind of as a happening. And the lyrics are, you know, you get the impression, even though, you know, we've seen the sort of written out list of stuff he's singing, you still get the impression that he's just sort of making it up as he's going along and that it doesn't matter what the words are. If someone were to do a cover of it, you wouldn't necessarily use, you know, Tommy Smothers and all of the same people that he mentions. In fact, it's hard to imagine doing a cover of it, although Paul has done the chorus in a medley live. Um, whereas What Is Life and My Sweet Lord, those are really, you know, fully crafted songs. So, but I, I take your point. If, if I had thought of it that way, I probably would have insisted I include Give Peace a Chance too, but mm. we didn't consult during the week in between, so. <laughs> no, I want your opinions. I want your list totally non-influenced by us, <laughs> okay? All right, Darren. All right. Um, that's a very fascinating list. Alan had 40 songs. The timing was perfect for him. Mine was close. I actually fell a little short of the, uh, which is okay, uh, timing-wise, 41 songs. Uh, now, I really took this seriously as being what and what I feel would be an accurate best of the solo Beatles 1968 to 1975 what it would look like taking into consideration uh, the amount of space that I had available uh all right so I took it literally let's see uh an LP you can get approximately 20 minutes of music on one side of an LP of course you can go a little less, uh, you can go a little more. The more you add per uh, side, you are taking away from the fidelity of the, the album. I think if you really start pushing it beyond 22, 23 minutes, it could begin to affect, you know, the playback, the, uh, you know, I think you gotta have like super, like great ears, but so, but I played by the rules. 20 minutes is the ballpark average for a side of an LP. Uh, CDs, you could get close to, if not right up to 80 minutes of music. I don't think you can go beyond 80. So I took that into consideration, 80 minutes. i split in at half an hour, 20 of this, divided by that co-tangent um, and a cosine, and I carry the one and decided, okay, if we're going to have a CD and we're going to have an LP, I want them to be identical. I never liked when a CD set comes out and if you buy the vinyl, you get extra songs on the vinyl, forcing me to buy them both. Uh, or if the vinyl is missing tracks, it cheats the person who prefers vinyl over CD. So my album had to feature the same exact track order, same track listing, um, same tracks. There'll be no variations here. So double CD I thought was was appropriate. I, I couldn't really see this stretched out to triple CD package without it becoming really tedious for the casual fan or the, you know, the moderate fan. Um, so two CDs filled almost to max. You're talking a four LP set and maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago, four LPs would have blown people's minds. Uh, financially, today, a four LP set happens pretty often. Just look at some of the things that come out on Record Store Day. So my green album, Alan went with green also, was going to be a two CD set or a four LP set modeled exactly like the red and blue albums from the Beatles. The same fonts. Um, I was even in my mind thinking, what would the photographs be like? All right, so we won't get into that here because it's pointless. Uh, but picture the same fonts, green, uh, and here are the songs. Now they're broken by side. I have everything timed out to the second. The album begins CD one, record one, side one. Uh, I almost did what Alan did with Give Peace a Chance. But thought to myself, I thought Give Peace a Chance was a strong, now 
mind you, I'm sorry, go back. The album is called The Beatles, The Solo Apple Years, 1968 to 1975. There's nothing from 1968 on the album, Shoot Me. <laughs> okay, but that is when the period begins. It's the fact that there's nothing in there. So, so, so we start call it 1969 to 75. Because 68 is when the Apple years began, when the first solo stuff came out. For all intents and purposes, okay. I don't know. I just didn't. It's called 1968. <laughs> Damn it. All right. So we start off. I couldn't drop Give Peace a Chance. I thought to myself, it's a, it's a strong opener, but he at the same time as a song, it's not a strong album opener. But the sentiment, I think, is essential to representing the best of Lennon during this period. And I didn't want edits. I never really liked what Shaved Fish did. Um, so you know what? We're going to open with Give Peace a Chance. If people don't like it, skip it. Uh, so that opens my album up. And then I skipped over Cold Turkey. And I will admit, I skipped over Cold Turkey because I look at it as of those first three Plastic Ono Band singles, it was the least successful commercially. If I could fit Cold Turkey in later on, I'll figure out a way. Ultimately, Cold Turkey didn't make the cut because something has to be cut in this. You're not going to get everything on this album. Give Peace a Chance goes into Instant Karma, We All Shine On. Now, to next first non-album single to appear is uh, Maybe I'm Amazed from Paul McCartney. I was almost going to totally ignore the McCartney album and I thought, yeah, I can't. Just because there were no singles from it, Maybe I'm Amazed is, for, you know, Maybe I'm Amazed is to McCartney would give Peace a Chance in a way is to Lennon. They kind of have to be represented. So song three on side one is Maybe I'm Amazed. And uh, side one closes out with the two, first two big George Harrison hits, My Sweet Lord and What Is Life. Five songs, side one of the LP, clocks in 20 minutes and 53 seconds in length. So now you flip over the vinyl to side two, or you go to track six on your first CD. It opens up what I thought would be a very strong opener of a side of an album. You drop the needle power to the people uh, from John and the Plastic Ono Band. Uh, follow that with Ringo's first appearance at Don't Come Easy. Um, and then Paul's first hit, Another Day. Uh, and then we stay in that vein. We jump a couple of months to Ram and Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey. The single version, which has that very slightly quicker fade at the end, uh, because the segue on Ram is goes into Smile Away. But if you listen closely to the 45, that fade out's much faster. So we use that as the third track on side two. No, fourth track on side two. And then side two ends with Bangladesh from George Harrison, a song that I was going to drop because I thought, was it a big enough hit? And then I thought, it's an important song to Harrison's career, like Give Peace a Chance, and like, maybe I'm amazed, Bangladesh was such a major event for Harrison and for music. And it's a non-album track. It was a lesser or modest hit single. It makes the cut. That ends side two of the album coming at 18 minutes and 35 seconds. So put record one away, take out record two. And for those of you with CDs, you're sitting comfortably with your feet still up uh, as we now go into song number 11 on CD one. Uh, I thought that this was also a very strong opener of a side. It's the opener of this album. It's Imagine, starting off side three of uh, the record. And then this one, out of, out, of, out of order, the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album was not going to be represented in my set. Uh, as much as it bothered me, uh, it didn't have the hit single. Uh, the single that was released, Mother, was, I thought, not a strong choice to be a single what would be appropriate? And then by the brainstorm, pff, light bulb goes off. And I thought after Imagine, we go back to Plastic Ono Band for Love. And I thought those work 
nicely together. Imagine into love, into give me some truth from imagine. So um, a, a triplet of, a, of, of major Lennon songs kicking off side three. Imagine, love, give me some truth. And then we go to back off Boogaloo, Ringo's second big hit single. And then a song and that I wasn't going to include and an album that I wasn't going to represent, but I thought, give peace a chance. Maybe I'm amazed. Bangladesh. John Lennon adopted New York City as his hometown. So New York City makes the cut and sometime in New York City gets represented. And uh, side three comes to an end with the sixth song that I was able to squeeze in. And that's the first top 10 hit from Wings, High, High, High. It's also the first song that we're going to hear from Wings in my set. I couldn't make up my mind what track to pull from Wildlife, you know, because I kind of like them and think of them sort of on equal levels. You know, there are still some people who don't like Wildlife. There weren't any singles from it. Wildlife doesn't have to be represented uh, here. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't justify putting Give Ireland Back to the Irish or Mary Had a Little Lamb or a Little Woman Love on the set. But, you know, all right. So high, 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 their first top 10 hit. That's the first Wings. That closes out side three of the album, which clocks into 20 minutes and 30 seconds. And uh, that brings us now to side four, the end record two, side four, the last five songs on CD number one. Opening up again, it out opens living in the material world. It opens this side four. Give me love, give me peace on earth from George. Give me love. Okay. My love from Paul McCartney and Wings from Red Rose Speedway. And then Live and Let Die, next single, next big huge hit for Wings follows. And then Mind Games from John, and I even made it a point in parentheses in the credit, everything was accurate with the plastic UFO no band, uh, mind games, and uh, disc one ends, side four ends and disc one ends with photograph from Ringo Starr. It goes out with a bang. Ringo's biggest hit song closes out CD number one and record number two. And I know you're waiting for this, Timing, side four, 18 minutes and 57 seconds for a grand total of 78 minutes and 55 second CD number one. Ken is going to fall off his chair in a minute now. <laughs> now, those, what was that? A lot of work figuring out the Now the, the CD listeners got to get up and put CD two in. Record, throw CD, record one in the sleeve. Out comes record number three. Here goes side five. And we pick up where we left off. The Ringo album from 73. Uh, a deep album cut. I didn't pick many of these deep album cuts, but I thought let's kick off disc two with I'm the greatest. <laughs> uh, because that's just, even though John wrote it, John hit a grand slam with that song because it's so Ringo. So we kick off the second disc with I'm the Greatest, followed by Your 16 uh, from the same album. 73, we continue Helen Wheels. The rest of the side is, is Wings. Side five is Ringo and Wings, and that's it. Uh, I'm the Greatest, Your 16, Helen Wheels, Jet, Band on the Run. Strong close to the side, and you have a 19-minute 17 second side five. Uh, over to side six, flipping over record three. Uh, we start off with, I thought a, a cool tune to open up a side. That was important with this, the song that's going to really give you up in the, in the head when you start the new side. Whatever gets you through the night with the horns and everything, John Lennon with the Plastic Ono Nuclear Band, which is mentioned on the singles label. That's followed by a little out of order here, but I did want to break up. We haven't heard from George in a while since Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. Uh, and that was not in, that was kind of a, by accident, unless I dug into living in the material world for an album cut. 
uh, it was kind of an unavoidable thing because, you know, Ringo, Band on the Run, monopolized that period in late 73. So after whatever gets you through the night, we get the title track, The Dark Horse, a little out of order, but that's the second song on side six. Uh, back to Ringo for Only You and You Alone off Goodnight Vienna in 74. And Paul McCartney and Wings Jr.'s Farm. And side six ends with Oh My My um, coming, off Goodnight v uh, coming off Ringo. Out of order again, but I was in this case trying to spread Ringo around a little bit and kind of break up the repetitiveness with the four of them. So that is uh, the end of record three coming in at 19 minutes and nine seconds. Oh my my, closes off that. Over to record four, the last record. Um, I thought it would be nice to open it with number nine dream. Uh, one of the classic Lennon songs. Um, so that opens up uh, uh, side seven of the album. John Lennon with the Plastic Ono Nuclear Band, followed by No No Song, which is from Goodnight Vienna. I started to actually have problems towards the end here and how I was going to fit these songs together because they sort of seemed like strays. And yet I saw I was going to come up a little short and I'm wondering what could I go back but it all worked out. Number nine dream goes into no, no song. And then the first song from 1975 is you from George upbeat tune coming after the fun. No, no song after you, then a song I was not going to include because it was not released on Apple. Listen to what the man said from wings. Although there is, I think some countries Venus and Mars was on the Apple label. Uh, but I thought I'm not going to get into those kinds of details. The album goes to 75. Listen to what the man sh said should have been on Wings Greatest. I think it was all, no, it wasn't left off all the best. Um, no, I don't think it was. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to leave it off my album. Listen to what the man says comes in as song four and side seven ends with Stand By Me. John's last hit single. Uh, and that's the seventh side. And now we come to the end and the end of the album is almost like a, a, su a summarization. Uh, side eight opens with the single version of Venus and Mars rock show. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to collect, even though it's on wingspan, I believe I wanted to collect the non album mix, which to my ears, when it came out, when I was 10 years old, I knew Venus and Mars rock show as one three minute and 39 second song. It was later when I got Venus and Mars that I realized they were two separate songs. Technically the way they were listed, they were much longer, but I knew Venus and Mars rock show first. So I thought it, it would work here in this setting. And then we kind of wrap things up with some kind of like the dramatic closers, the backseat of my car from Paul and Linda McCartney. I always thought was a, one of McCartney's most grand um, songs and what an ending to Ram. And we're nearing the end here. So we're going to go back and this chestnut that was a single in the UK, the back scene of my car. Then Ringo's commentary on the breakup, early 1970. Uh, the next to last song on the album. Happy Christmas War is over. I wasn't going to put it on because it was a Christmas song, but again, it's such an important part of Lennon's discography. At the end, is a, towards the end is a good place for it. The sentiment is timeless. All Things Must Pass ends the album. The title track to All Things Must Pass uh, closes everything out. Side eight, a measly 17 minutes and 38 seconds, bringing us to a 74 minute, 27 second second disc. I could have fit probably two more songs, but at this point I thought, I think I got it right. Uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time digging out album cuts, something off Ram, something off McCartney. Um, did I did I shortchange All Things Must Pass now, three songs? Um, should I go to a living in the material world? Yeah, but what are you going to put there? It's your opinion. So I left well enough alone. Huh. 41 songs, two CDs, four LPs, Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. That's a good compilation. I'm very impressed with it. I can tell that you really uh, toiled away at this and spent a lot of time on the timing. 
Yeah, didn't sleep much this week. Um, <laughs> between Ringo concerts and working on this till three, four in the morning a couple of nights. And, um, and of course, the FUV gig, which really is the priority, really. Uh-huh. Uh, so, but I'm going to nap when we're done recording this show. Okay. I, I, I realized with listening to yours that uh, I had thrown away all my songs from Goodnight Vienna, for instance. I had the same ones you did. Um, and one by one, they got eliminated. And I, I should have put one back today when I was looking for stuff to, to restore. I, too, but... was listening to what you said in our emails before we did the show in our pre-discussions. I didn't want to hack because I thought, well, I'm going to put Mary Had a Little Lamb. We'll get give Ireland back to the Irish in here. Uh, you know, because I want like what was considered what 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 the what the suits and McCartney thought would be hits should be on a best of album. And as I'm going, I'm going, no, it can't can't happen. Um, if this was going to be uh, like a Spotify playlist, a complete, then absolutely. But uh, and and that's why I also ended up dropping Cold Turkey, which was really not my intention. And, you know, Ding Dong, Ding Dong didn't make the cut. Letting Go didn't make the cut. I really wanted to put it all down to Goodnight Vienna because and put the single version. But yeah. I thought towards the end of the album was a little anticlimactic. I'll shut up now. No, you know, when we first talked about doing this, and I certainly had no idea how difficult it was going to be. And all I did was just in the very beginning, I just compiled a list of the singles that I wanted. And it still was way too much. Mm-hmm. And I got to admit that I did not time this. But I have a feeling since, Alan, you got 40 songs on yours and it timed out to, to under, um, was 160, 164 minutes is the, the max, right? And you have how many songs, Darren? 41. Okay. All right. Well, I have 34. So this should work. <laughs> well, didn't you, you're it's just everybody knows you just don't like the solo stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't your initial suggestion was to pick 25 songs? That's right. No, I thought, well, I, I thought I, that, no, I thought it would be like six songs aside, 24 songs, but the CDs can have bonus tracks. Right. I have no problem with the CDs having more than the LPs. I understand where you're coming from. But, uh, and, okay, where, where are you getting the 25? Is that 25 backwards? Could you see that? Little visual? No, it's forwards. That's forward. Okay. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, this was really tough because there's so many album cuts that I love and I want to put them in there. And then there's certain singles that I, I, I said, how can you not have them in there? Any song that hit number one, how can you exclude them? You know, although... The argument could be made, as a couple of our listeners have said to me, that we're very, uh, you know, American centric here. And so I know how high the songs went on the charts here on the Billboard charts. I don't always think about in the UK and other countries, but um, it is kind of how my mind works. But uh, maybe some thought should be applied to how it did in other parts of the world. Very quickly, before you start. Do you guys, you have to be from New York, I think, for this. Who remembers the commercials that used to run on Channel 11 WPIX in the 70s? The old guy selling the classical uh, box set of the, um, of the most beautiful music. You know, how many of you remember Borden's blah, 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 whatever. You know what I mean? I picture you now in a tuxedo at a piano with a candelabra selling the Ken Michaels a uh, uh, volume of beautiful solo Beatles songs here. <laughs> Ten volumes. Okay. I never pictured myself that way. Okay. I, I guess that's kind of a compliment. Yes. He, Alan's the classical guy. You I know. know. Look <laughs> at him. Uh, Did you know that the following was from the Polyphys? Yes, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so many of the great masters. <laughs> anyway, so my list... Um, yeah, I have 34 songs. And then I also put in parentheses what I might add if this was an iTunes release and there were a few bonus tracks. So I'm cheating a little bit. But anyway, I had to start with Give Peace a Chance because first of all, it is the first solo Beatles single. I love the fact that it starts with the counting. 
two or one, two, three, four. It's a great way to open an album. And it is a very significant song because of what John and Yoko were going through at the time with um, all their events for peace, the bed ends, you name it. Um, is it a strong song composition? Maybe not, but um, the chorus is so important, you know, uh, and Paul has performed it, just the chorus. Ringo has performed it as well. Um, it's an important part of the, the history of John Lennon and, um, and, and the mere fact that it is the first single, I think you should give it some weight for that, for that reason and to lead off that way. Um, Instant Karma was my next one. And I didn't want to have to drop Cold Turkey because that's a great song too. Um, but Instant Karma is such a great rock song and it is a classic and it was a high charting song at number three in the US and it still gets airplay and it still sounds fantastic. I love the rawness of it. Everything about that song. It's one of my favorite of John's singles. <clears throat> I followed that with Maybe I'm Amazed, of course. How can you not put that in there? My Sweet Lord and What Is Life, the two big hits from All Things Must Pass. And then I had to include the title track to All Things Must Pass, which I think over the years has really gained in stature as a great album cut. And for, you know, all the philosophical things that George says in the song. Um, follow that with God. Plastic on Old Band is a very difficult album to represent here. Because like you said, Darren, <clears throat> you know, Mother is a great song, but it's not a, it certainly wasn't made to be a single. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was not a commercial album by any means, but God is just so important with what he's saying in the song. I know a lot of people might be uncomfortable with it when he's striking down all the icons and saying, I don't believe in Beatles, but it tells you where his head was at at that time. And it took a lot of guts for John to say, not only what he said in that song, but the whole album. If I had to have one song represent Plastic Ono Band, it had to be the song God. Then I followed that with It Don't Come Easy. Ram, boy, Ram is- Ram's hard. So many great, so many great songs from Ram at this point. And, you know, as we've said many times, it really has gained in stature now as an album to the point where a lot of people consider it their favorite McCartney album. But Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey was a number one hit here in the States. Of course, it wasn't a single in the UK, but it was number one, his first number one here. And I put Backseat of My Car in there. Very difficult for me to not put too many people in there. Hmm. Um, for me to go beyond two songs per album is, it's very difficult. Of course, All Things Must Pass is much easier because it's you know a double album or triple, depending on how you look at it. You had to put Imagine in there. I still have this typed as Jealous Guy or Give Me Some Truth. <laughs> I can't make up my mind between I the I did two the same thing. You know, Give Me Some Truth is a song that now, I mean, because of the political climate that we're in, we've been in for a long time, it's always apropos to hear that song for something going on in the news. So it gets a lot of airplay. But at the same time, Jealous Guy is one of John's greatest love songs one of his greatest ballads how do you pick between the two of them so at this moment i'm going to go with jealous guy all right uh follow that with tomorrow i wanted there to be something to represent wildlife tomorrow should have been a single from the album it's a great commercial track great hooks in it amazing vocals from paul um if i had to pick any one song from wildlife that's the one then I also had to put in Back Off Oogaloo. Not only was it a top 10 hit here, but it actually was the biggest hit that, that Ringo had in the UK, which may surprise some people. It went to number two on the charts there. Even the, the number ones from Ringo in the US, Photograph and Year 16, didn't hit number one in the UK for him. But Back Off Oogaloo was his biggest hit. And, you know, I love the sound of that record, his drumming on it the way it kicks off the way it does George's production it's it's a great single and then like you Darren I put New York City in did you put New York City in Alan no um it was in the four hour version but it got kicked out okay yeah you have to put something well I feel every album should be represented with one song at least one song 
So if you're going to pick one from some time in New York City, the most digestible one and uh, a great rocker without getting into too much politics is New York City. I always love that song. It's got a great Chuck Berry feel to it. So um, and then followed that with another great rock song and high, high, high. Like you, Darren, you know, I, I, I was wrestling with Give Ireland Back to the Irish because it's the first wing single, period. Mm -hmm. I still love the song. It didn't chart that high. But, you know, you got to trim this list somewhere. And there's so many songs that I had to leave out. But High, High, High made the top 10 here. Um, it's a great studio recording. It's a great live recording. But here's something different. I put in Bangladesh, but the live recording of Bangladesh. Because I think it's such a great, a great performance of the song. Great way to end that concert. Has a lot more life to it than the studio version, which I do love. But I thought it'd be cool to put the live one in there. Um, follow that with My Love. Then Give Me Love. Back to back, two number one singles here in the States. Um, you know, if I was to go with the spiritual stuff that I love from George, I would certainly put the light that has lighted the world in there and who can see it like you did, Alan. But I went with the more commercial song, which I thought should have been the second single, which is Don't Let Me Wait Too Long. I really think that song would have been, you know, a good follow up to Give Me Love. It's incredible. There was only one single from that album. Then I've got Live and Let Die, which had to be in there. Uh, Mind Games, Next to um, Woman, and Instant Karma, my favorite Lennon single. Love the whole production behind that. And there's so many songs on the Mind Games album that I wanted on here. Um, but again, you are limited with what you have here. Photograph, You're 16, Band on the Run had to be in there. And despite the fact that Band on the Run had other hits, I didn't put those in there, but I put 1985 in there because it's one of the greatest album closers of all time. Love the whole piano lick, how everything builds around it. Incredible production. Then I had Whatever Gets You Through the Night, Number Nine Dream. If we could expand this to three or four CDs, there'd be Stealing Glass in there. There'd be Scared in there. There'd be Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. But I only put two, and I put the two singles in there. And Number Nine Dream is, is a, another song that has gained in stature through the years. I'm hearing it a lot more on the radio than I used to. Mm -hmm. John stuff. I hear it more now than whatever gets you through the night, oddly enough. Maybe it's just when I'm listening. Anyway, um, then I've got Only You, Dark Horse, uh, Junior's Farm, Listen to What the Man Said, and I really, I wanted to be clever here and close with the answers at the end. But I thought, you know, I love the song. It's one of my favorite George Solo songs. But I think this guitar can't keep from crying would be a better song to close with. So those are my picks. But I also had, if we can add bonus tracks like on an iTunes release, just a few other ones here. I wanted the, the title track to Sentimental Journey because I thought that it's a very easy listen. You know, I, I love the whole performance of Ringo's vocals on that song. Something should represent that album, although I didn't pick anything from Buku's of Blues. Um, <laughs> a Waiting on You All. Yeah. On there. I mean, that that could have easily have been a third single from All Things Must Pass. All Things Must Pass is one of those albums where if when you attempt to go deeper, it's like, but where do I go? There's mm. so many songs you could pick and it's like you end up you know what? They're canceling each other out. I'm going to have to move on. That's when I was doing it. I was like, I, how do I beware of darkness? I know. Waiting on you all. All things must pass. Isn't it a pity? I mean, that was technically, that charted, that was considered a double A side. Um, and that, they would have, kinda... that would have taken over seven minutes and you could get two songs in. Yeah, I didn't want to get <laughs> caught up in that, but I, I did think that. And I'm like, you know, you know what? I, I just can't. To be fair and spread things out as even as possible. But All Things Must Pass was tough because of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and the longer songs are tough to fit in there as much as I want them in there. 
Um, Little Lamb Dragonfly, I wanted in here, but it's over six minutes long. Um, I also put Helen Wheels. What a great rock song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's painful not to put this in here. Um, Out the Blue is one of my favorite Lennon oh, yeah. songs. I wanted that in there. Six o'clock, I wanted in there. And I wanted Snookaroo. I mean, that's one of the great Ringo rock songs I wish he would do live. And, uh, you know, Elton John, just like on Whatever Gets You Through the Night, provided so much spark in that song. You know, it has such a life to it. Uh, I would love to have Snookaroo on there. And then finally, I would want Venus and Mars Rock Show, but the full album version. I can't stand the single version. You know, there's so much about the, the full version that flows so well, and it just works that way. And it was just cut to pieces on the single. And uh, I would assume it, that in 75, Ken, you got Venus and Mars, uh, the album first had it, knew it. And then when later in the year, when uh, the third single comes out, Venus and Mars Rock Show, that was like nails on the blackboard for you. Yeah, it was. I yeah, still bought it anyway because I had to have it. It was like I bought every single. And for me, it was the exact opposite. For some reason, probably because I was 10 and I didn't have money hanging out of my pockets. You know, I had to pick and choose what I asked for. I had to do my chores and get an album. Uh, I waited till like the end of the year for Venus and Mars. In the meantime, uh, I got the Venus and Mars rock show single. So I knew it, you know, f first. Mm. That part in the song where Paul sings, uh, the lights go down, they're back in town, okay, mm -hmm. taken out of it completely. That's so much, a, you know, a part yeah. of the song. Yeah. You know. Uh, I don't it know. sounds I, awkward to me now, but. What's that? It sounds awkward to me now, but I, I still remember listening, getting, I was excited. I'm looking, oh my goodness, look at it. Look at the size of the tracks on the vinyl, five and a half minutes. It's just rock show. And I listened to it and thought, this is cool, but it boy is a jump all over the place mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. knew the edit. Mm -hmm. And still to this day, it's the greatest concert opener of his career, as far as I'm concerned. We did Venus and Mars yeah. Rock Show into Jet, in my opinion, anyway. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's my list. And uh, if you think this is easy, you folks watching this, try this. Do this. Yeah. <laughs> I have a suggestion. What's Why that? don't we post our lists on our two Facebook pages? Too much? What do you think? Okay. Well, I'd want people to watch this show first, and then it would be a surprise to them what we pick instead oh, of yeah. being it. All right. You're not getting the lists on the Facebook pages, folks. Sorry. Blame Ken. <laughs> he's the guy who picked 25 songs first now he's denying it <laughs> people are going to believe you now mm -hmm. anyway so these were great lists and uh at some point we'll do 1976 to 1980 so that that will be sad because there won't be that much john in there yeah so. you could, we couldn't do that it wouldn't work because of that mm. you know and and if we were to create later volumes John would disappear. George's output slowed down considerably. Ringo really hit, like, went through that very, uh, that down period where, uh, you know, the quality dipped off a bit. Um, and it would become a, a, a McCart essentially a McCartney best of with some Ringo scattered here and some George here and there. Uh, this worked, I, and that's why I put the Apple years in the title of mine. Because why would we be just singling out? Oh, you know what? It's the Apple years. Um, you know, and that, that, that popular debate, what solo songs would have been Beatles songs that people like to... The Beatles put out an album in 1970. Not Let It Be, but a brand new album, the follow-up to Abbey Road. You know, what would be on it? Maybe I'm amazed. Maybe I'm amazed. Uh, All Things Must Pass maybe would make the cut that time. You know, what songs were meant to be Beatles songs. It don't come easy, definitely. That would have been a single. The first Beatles single written by Ringo. You know, that's how I always looked at it, don't come easy. I'm, I always think of them as solo songs. Because even if they started in the Beatles, they finished on their own. 
And, you know, the Beatles as solo artists put their own stamp on things. They had their own individual styles. You know, something like My Sweet Lord or What Is Life, even though Ringo, pretty sure Ringo's on My Sweet Lord. There's always this debate with all the, you know, the all things must pass stuff. Yeah. You know, who plays on each track. But, you know, I can hear John and Paul on songs on All Things Must Pass, although the, the title track, because they worked on it, you know, during Get Back, Let It Be, they had their own signature sounds that they were developing styles of their own. Mm -hmm. They're still, even when they were in the Beatles, they weren't Beatles songs. They belonged to the songwriters who wrote them. You know, they were finished on their own and the other Beatles could have been some influence on them, but they still are their own individual songwriters. That's kind of the way that I look at it. Alan? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Paul went for years um, mining the catalog of unfinished things he wrote during the Beatles era, you know, um, Teddy Boy on the first album. Um, there were there were things that go through for several years and, and who knows, he may still he may still go back and dig up something that we've never heard of that, uh, you know, listen, um, on um, off the ground, the sort of little outro that it was released in Japan as a, a, a bonus track on the double CD that they put out, Cosmically Conscious, that was from 68. Um, so this was 1993 that came out. So, uh, you know, he he dips back into the old catalog. But if you know, if you look at I mean, in in, in the stuff that we did for volume one, of the book, you know, you've got another day, you've got you know, a whole bunch of things were done at the Let It Be sessions, even if he just played through it and nobody was listening or, you know, he's playing and, every, and you hear talking in the background, yeah. backseat in my car, there's a little bit of, there's, uh, um, you know, th there's like tons of stuff really. Uh, so uh, it'd be interesting to know what these things would have sounded like if the Beatles, did them but I, I see what you're saying I mean they did have sort of a, a stamp that makes the solo recordings really different from what they would have been if it was the Beatles and certain inevitability to the solo version that makes it somehow difficult to imagine a Beatles version you know I mean Teddy Boy there's a Beatles version of it sort of but it's really mostly a Paul version you know, the, the rest of them aren't that engaged mm. by it. And the album version, when he did it on McCartney, is, is a lot tighter. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's no doubt that there are certain songs that the Beatles did in their solo careers that sound Beatlesque that the Beatles could have done. Oh, sure. Of course, yeah. John brought up the song Woman being the, you know, the most Beatly song on Double Fantasy. There are some songs like, um, I think of I Know I Know from Mind Games as having a real Beatles sound to it. You know, there's no doubt about it because it's part of who they are, but they also develop their own sound and their own styles. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's so much stuff they've done in their solo careers that I could never picture the others on. <laughs> you know, yeah. who's going to join Paul on Silly Love Songs? You know, <laughs> probably not John. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Or good night tonight, you know, whatever. And Paul, you know, even to this day, dips back to other songs post Beatles, you know, Frank Sinatra's Party, you know, really goes all the way back to 1975. And uh, when winter comes, mm -hmm. on McCartney Three is from the early 90s, you know. So happens all throughout his career. Anyway, so I hope that you all enjoyed our look of what we would put on these compilations. And so why don't we uh, finish things off by telling everybody what we're doing right now and how they can get in contact with us. Darren, you lead off. Well, I think what I'll do is I will publish my list on my Facebook pages, but I'll do it in some point soon. Um, I won't do it right away. If you want to come over, look for me on Facebook. There are two pages. One is Darren DeVivo. Send me a friend request. The other page you would uh, click follow. I guess you used to click like. I don't. I don't get Facebook. But uh, the other page is Darren is a longer name that I never remember. Um, I think it's 
Darren DeVivo, WFUV Beatles podcaster. Um, so I'll get you on both pages. Just like go, go to at least one of them. And at some point, like I said, in the next week or so, maybe I'll post my list there um, on those pages. If you want to shoot me an email, email me at WFUV uh, directly, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. And as for listening, uh, um, on the air at 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday nights, on WFUV, which is 90.7 FM in the New York metro area. We stream at WFUV.org and we have an app you can download. And you can also ask your smart speaker to play WFUV. Um, so mid uh, 10 p.m., 10 p.m., Monday through Thursday nights, Saturday afternoons, 1 to 4 p.m. is when you'll find me on member supported public radio, WFUV. Okay, very good. We'll save you for last, Alan, because you'll give everybody our contact info. Okay. Um, as for me, you can visit my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. You're going to find loads of audio interviews on there with people in the Beatle world, including Alan. You know, an interview I did with him many years ago is on there. And um, there is a page on there for what I call Beatles trivia and games. And every single week from Monday through Sunday, you have a chance to win one out of 10 great prizes. And just recently, I got one copy of this DVD, The Beatles and India, mm. on DVD, one on Blu-ray. You can have a choice right now anyway. Um, got a few copies left of the first CD for uh, Playpool, Lenin, uh, Lenin Delirium monolith of phobos it's called and this the super deluxe version of new okay all kinds of bonus stuff is on there bonus audio and video so visit the website it's kenmichaelsradio.com also my other podcast show bi-weekly show talk more talk the next show will be next monday night which is june the 13th at 9 p.m eastern we're just going to do a q a with our viewers they can submit questions as we're doing the show live. We've been asking them right. to submit questions to, to us in preparation. So we have a few questions ready anyway. They could be directed to any one of us. It's all opinion related stuff, no trivia there. And, uh, you know, I hope that we can do something like that here. Uh -huh. Tends to be popular on YouTube channels. So again, it's Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's with me, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. And, um, and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Then there's my syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. And uh, I just finished producing a one hour Paul McCartney special for his 80th birthday. And that's on select radio stations, which you can find listed on my website, on my Every Little Thing page at kenmichaelsradio.com. And finally, there's my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is all Beatles content on there interviews one-on-one -on -one and panel discussions as well. Um, I'm starting a new series, which I will do once in a while, which I decided to call Young Blood. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm talking to people who are 40 and younger, who are either DJs on the Beatles or podcasters and asking their opinions on certain things. So I have Ethan Alexanian, who has his own uh, podcast, Fans on the Run, and Scott O'Rourke, who does a Beatles show on WUSB on Long Island at Stony Brook University. Thursdays, every, uh, every other Thursday, he has a show called With the Beatles. And I pose the question to them, it's a two-parter, if you could attend the sessions for any Beatles album, what would you pick? And then do the same thing for a solo Beatles album, and then explain why. And to get the opinions, the perspectives of younger people in doing so. So that's my latest show on my YouTube channel. There'll be lots of interviews coming in the weeks ahead. It's Ken Michaels Radio. And if you can, please subscribe to that one. Okay. We're saving the best for last. <laughs> Alan, you're next. Okay. Well, what I'm up to mainly at the moment is working on volume two of McCartney Legacy. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of just starting it. So, I mean, we have been collecting a lot of research and, and other stuff. So just starting the writing part, um, which more or less begins with the McGear album, which was fundamentally a Wings audition album in some ways. Um, there was 
you may know a, a really interesting reissue of it a couple of years ago on Cherry Red Records, um, but pay no attention to the liner notes, which have a ton of stuff wrong. I mean, they're generally not bad, but if you want things like what year things were done in and how things were done, it's, it's um, yeah, it's frustrating. Anyway, um, so we're sort of in the middle of that. And otherwise, uh, you can get in touch with me um, by writing to me in, at Facebook, uh, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can contact all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. I'll say it again because it's so long. Things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Things we said today radio show is all one word. Uh, we have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have a couple of Facebook pages. Um, things we said today, big surprise. And things we said today, Beatles radio fans. The links to the shows get posted on Facebook. Um, we hope you're watching this on YouTube and that you subscribe to us if you're doing it. Um, you can also find audio versions on Podbean, uh, iTunes. I think Google has a service that, that has us too. Um, and there are various other, we're sort of losing track of the podcasting um, things that, you know, they get picked up and distributed and we hope you're hearing and or watching and, um, and enjoying them. So that's it for me. Okay, great. I forgot to tell you one thing, Alan. When I was at Fenway Park, I picked up something for you. <laughs> this is a cup that you could drink out of. Well, thanks. Can you you just hold on to it until I see you again? <laughs> I was looking for a big poppy bobblehead for you, but I couldn't find one there. So do they have bambino like bobbleheads? <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> All right. So this has been great. Thanks so much, Alan and, uh, and Darren. Just to make sure we don't forget, because this is our, uh, our most recent show leading up to Paul's 80th birthday. Very mm -hmm. happy birthday to you, Paul. Yes. Happy, yeah. happy, birthday. happy birthday, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for all thank the great you all the great memories and i hope you guys watching have a chance to see paul and ringo live they're still out there god bless them and uh thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time <laughs>